Well, good day everyone. Russ Barkley here, back with our usual weekly research review of research published in the past week in journals on ADHD. As always, the articles that I discuss are in the description with the video along with the link to the journal website. Uh, and then I list the other articles that were published that week in journals that I'm not going to review. So just wanted to refresh your memory with that. So, uh, so let's get started. As, as always, we begin with a dad joke. And so here's your dad joke for this weekend. So I'm afraid for the calendar. Its days are numbered. <laughs> that is sick. Of course, sick to my teenage grandson means good, so maybe that was good, but hope you got a laugh out of that one. So, uh, we're going to focus on five studies that were published this week briefly, uh, which I thought were of significance in their findings, or brought up some issues I thought you ought to be aware of in looking at research on these topics. Now, the first is a study, this one out of Turkey, which is a study of mothers of children with ADHD, and it's looking at the incidence of that new attention disorder called cognitive disengagement syndrome. Used to be called sluggish cognitive tempo. You can find some lectures on my channel on this second attention disorder, which does overlap with ADHD. About 50% of all cases of one seem to have the other, but they're also independent of each other. So they can be comorbid, but they're not identical. They're actually rather different attention disorders. So. This study took a look at 223 mothers who had children diagnosed with ADHD and evaluated the mothers for various measures of psychiatric functioning and especially used my rating scale of sluggish cognitive tempo, now called CDS. Uh, and what the study found, very interesting, is that, first of all, it divided the children into four groups. So they had a group that had no psychiatric disorders, a control group. There was a group that the children only had ADHD. Uh, in the third group, they had another psychiatric disorder and ADHD. So that's a comorbid group. And then the final group was those who had another psychiatric disorder, but no ADHD. So hope you understand the, the four group comparisons here. Overall, what the study found is that cognitive disengagement syndrome was associated with mothers who had children with ADHD, and it was at its greatest in children who had ADHD and other psychiatric disorders. But compared to the kids who had no psychiatric disorders, their mothers were very low. So it suggests that there is some degree of familial, possibly genetic relationship between CDS in mothers, and ADHD in their offspring. Now, that would make sense because we know that there is some degree of genetic heritability to CDS, not quite as high as ADHD, but nearly so. The heritability of ADHD, meaning the extent to which genetic, uh, genetic factors account for individual differences in ADHD, is around 0.7 to 0.8 across most studies. That's very high meaning about 70 to 80% of the variation in symptoms in the population is accounted for by differences in genetics. In CDS, that is between about 0.55 and 0.65 in terms of heritability. So a little less heritable than ADHD, but not by much, uh, and suggesting that genetic factors play a majority role in individual differences in both syndromes, but the environment could be playing a greater role in CDS as well. So uh, a very interesting study worth following up on for study I know of on CDS in mothers who had children with ADHD. Uh, so congrats to my colleagues over there in Turkey for a very nice study here. All right, next up is a meta-analysis out of China. Uh, this one appeared in the journal Europe PMC, and it is a study uh, that is uh, done by a Chinese group that looks at the various studies that linked ADHD with risk for bronchial asthma. So the authors found a total of 10 articles, 
involving more than 700,000 participants and included the results in their meta-analysis. And what they found is, of course, what we've seen in individual studies earlier, is that there does appear to be an elevated risk of asthma in children with ADHD. The risk is about 50% greater if you have ADHD than if you don't. Now still, the vast majority of children with and without ADHD don't have asthma, but clearly it's suggesting that where ADHD is there, it elevates the risk to some extent. The authors found a variety of factors that might be mediating this relationship from demographic factors to healthcare access to socioeconomic status factors, comorbidity, of course, genetic susceptibility to both disorders, uh, and so on. By the way, research has shown that the genes that increase risk for ADHD in individuals are also genes that are related to various medical problems, including allergies and, in this case, uh, asthma as well. So uh, not surprising, but as you know, I like meta-analyses because they help us identify the most robust findings out there in the literature by combining results across many different studies. So a good meta-analysis there. Uh, moving along, here's an article that was published in the Journal of Psychiatric Research, this one also by a Chinese group, uh, and it is a meta-analysis that is comparing frontal lobe activation in kids with autism spectrum disorder and kids with ADHD. Uh, and they're using a neuroimaging technique known as functional near infrared spectroscopy. So they're really looking not so much at brain structure here, that's what MRIs do, and even functional MRI does. They're looking at activation, and I believe that this, is, this method relies primarily on tracking cerebral blood flow. Uh, and it's also looking at the groups and comparing them on how activated the prefrontal cortex was when they were doing certain executive function tasks. Uh, in this instance, they looked at inhibitory tests, and they also looked at working memory tests, especially a task called the NBAC task, which is a, a difficult uh, working memory task that's often used in neuropsychological research. So what did they find? Uh, first of all, they note that this is the first systematic review and meta-analysis of all of the different studies that have looked at prefrontal activation on this task during these tests. Uh, and they found 630 articles originally in their research review, and then they winnowed it down to nine studies that met their criteria for inclusion. So a lot of studies out there, but they weren't very well done, weren't very rigorous, and so on. So looking at the most rigorous studies, what they found is that both children with ASD and ADHD showed somewhat weakened levels of activation in the prefrontal cortex during inhibitory tasks. Makes sense that we would see that in ADHD. It's a inhibitory disorder in addition, of course, to being a self-regulation disorder. Uh, but the fact that they found it in ASD is, is a little bit new. Ordinarily, inhibitory deficits track more with ADHD than ASD. Uh, but again, these were not necessarily pure cases of either disorder. They can be contaminated somewhat with symptoms of the other, and that might account for that. What they did find is that the pattern of activation in the prefrontal cortex was opposite between these two groups when they were doing the working memory task, the NBAC task. So there's hyperactivation of the prefrontal cortex is linked with autism spectrum disorder. Whereas with ADHD, as we've seen in many other studies, there's hypoactivation of the prefrontal cortex in kids with ADHD. Uh, and as we know, ADHD produces major problems with working memory, as you can see in my other videos on this channel. So very nice meta-analysis there. Uh, let's move along to our fourth study. This one published in Psychiatry Research, and it is on the link of maternal smoking during pregnancy and cortical structure in children with ADHD. Uh, and what is interesting about this study is that it looked at, it classified mothers who smoked based on self-report of smoking, but then it also reclassified mothers 
as to whether they smoked or not based on epigenetic markers in their own DNA. If you smoke, and you smoke a lot, or you smoke for a prolonged period of time, there are these epigenetic markers that wind up on certain genes that can tell whether or not you may be a smoker. Uh, and so they were looking at both genetic markers for smoking, epigenetic, and they were looking also at self-report of smoking. And then they looked at ADHD in the offspring, but principally they were looking at cortical structure of the brain in these different groups. So overall, what they found in this study uh, is the following. They found that the groups in which mothers reported smoking or didn't report smoking by self-report now were no different. No differences in the brain structure, the cortical structure of the children with ADHD between these groups. So they couldn't find any effect, so to speak, or any relationship of maternal smoking with brain structure when mothers self-reported. However, when they looked at epigenetic markers, they found that the mothers who had the markers for smoking had children with somewhat smaller surface areas in the right orbital frontal cortex, as well as in the middle temporal cortex uh, and in the perihippocampal gyrus compared to the children whose mothers did not have these markers. Now, at first blush, this would suggest that maternal smoking, particularly when it's corroborated by epigenetic markers, might be having some effect on brain structure in children with ADHD. Uh, that's still very possible. But I also want to remind you that earlier studies that found a link of smoking with risk of ADHD, that correlation, that relationship, disappeared when we controlled for the mother's degree of ADHD, not just smoking, and the polygenetic risk scores in those women. And what they found, to put it simply, is that smoking in mothers during pregnancy was more of a marker that the mother has ADHD, and that is what was producing the risk of ADHD in the offspring. It wasn't the smoking having a direct causal effect on risk of ADHD. And that's still very possible in this study as well, because they didn't measure maternal ADHD. It's possible that women with ADHD who smoke during pregnancy are also more likely to have these epigenetic markers. And it's not the smoking, and it's not the markers, it's the mother's ADHD that could be creating this risk. So uh, again, we need more genetically informed studies when we look at these risk factors between what parents do and the risk for ADHD or the risk of brain development problems in the offspring of those pregnancies. We need genetically informed designs. What does that mean? We need to measure the extent to which the parents also have ADHD, and if possible, even genotype them to see if they have carriers for some of the genes for ADHD. That would help sort all of this out. So an interesting study, interesting result, not definitive, certainly doesn't prove that smoking in mothers is related or, or causing brain structural problems in the children. Hints at it, but needs some replication. Okay, I think I've beaten that horse to death. Let's move on to our final study, which is by my good friend and former colleague at UMass Medical Center, George Dupal, along with other colleagues who I know, such as Steve Evans. This is a very good paper that talks about school-based interventions for adolescents with ADHD. So we're gonna end on a high note here because this paper is based on a large study across Northeastern and Midwestern school districts in which a large sample of teens participated in a school-based intervention for their ADHD, and that program is called the Challenging Horizons Program. It's a wonderful school-based multi-component intervention that takes place at school, after school, by paraprofessionals who are trained to work with the teens both on academic skills, social skills, study skills, and organizational skills. They also have sports participation and they work on that as well. They also provide consultation to the teachers of these teens to help them with 
management during the school day, and they even provide some sessions for parents on home management of these teens as well. So a nice multi-component program. Previous studies that have compared this treatment approach to others or to no treatment approaches have found that the program is effective at helping these teens beyond simply routine care or weightless controls or kids who didn't receive any intervention. So it's an already established program, which I often recommend to schools to help teens with ADHD. Again, Challenging Horizons program. You can use Google Scholar to look at the articles on this. You can also write to the authors of this paper in order to obtain the treatment manual. The program does have a manual with it for how to implement it. Uh, and so what did they find? They were looking at what predicted how well teens turned out who participated in this program. And what they found uh, was, was very interesting. They had different trajectories of how well the teens did, and they found that there was a positive treatment response in the teens ranging from 61% of the teens measured by their report cards to 100% of the teens measured by ratings of their inattention, organizational skills, and social skills. So uh, a very effective program here for helping these teens in school, depending upon the outcome measure you want to look at, will depend upon the success that you're getting. What they did find is that organizational skills and academic grade treatment trajectories were predicted best by sex, okay? So girls versus boys, one did better than the other. Pre-treatment anxiety, we've seen this before. The more anxious people are before treatment, believe it or not, the better they do in behavioral-based treatments. And they also found that treatment dosage, how much treatment they got, how much they participated in treatment, was a predictor of how well they turned out. So some very interesting information there on what predicts how well teens will do in the Challenging Horizons program. But this particular study in and of itself wasn't meant to prove that the CHP program works. That's already been done in other studies, uh, including earlier reports of this particular group of individuals as well. So, so there you have it. That's our five studies for this week. Hope you found them informative. Uh, as always, if you're not a subscriber, think about subscribing to the channel. I, I hope you're finding it informative. Uh, if you know people that might benefit, please recommend the channel to them as well. And then have a look at the description that goes with this video for the timeline for discussing these studies, as well as for the links to the studies that I've discussed. So there you have it, everybody. Good seeing you this weekend. I'll catch up with you next week with some other commentaries and, again, another research review. So be well, everybody, and enjoy your weekend.